Library of the University. One day, not long after the accident, asked me if I would be interested in teaching a Sunday school class at Murdoch Center. He informed me that Murdoch Center was a public residential facility that I later learned how 1,500 children and adults, who in those days I knew nothing about people retardation. And in my early 20s, I had not le yet learned the art of producing a quick thinking no, followed by a quick thinking, believable if mendacious excuse to avoid doing what I neither had the time nor the desire, much less the experience to do. Even as it may, a week or so later, on a warm Sunday morning, I found myself 20 miles north of Durham at Murdoch Center in Butner, North Carolina, the same small town where today, 40 years later, Bernie Madoff resides in the nearby federal prison that I suppose he will enjoy for the remainder of his life. Murdoch Center was not the oldest residential institution of its sort in North Carolina. The state founded its first facility about 110 miles southeast of Butner in the town of Kinston. The Caswell Center, formerly known as the North Carolina Training School for the Feeble-Minded, had been North Carolina's first residential facility for the ostensible purpose of educating the state's intellectually disabled children and adults, but had become almost from the more moment of its founding in 1914, an 807-acre camp for concentrating teenagers and adults of the breeding age. Eugenics, not education or elamocenary aims, had moved the ordinarily stingy North Carolina General Assembly to fund Caswell Training School in 1911. Murdoch Center's history was, I suppose, even more curious than was Caswell Training School's beginnings. During World War II, the War Department took the tobacco farms of a dozen or so Granville County families through eminent domain for the, con for the construction of an army training camp that became known as Camp Butner. After the war, the state of North Carolina acquired the camp and created a new institution for the mentally ill, the John Umstead Hospital, named for the legislator who proposed the facility. Following the post-war creation of the psychiatric hospital in 1948, the state established the Butner Training School for the Feeble-Minded that received inmates from the overcrowded Haswell Training School. In 1963, the state changed the name of the Training School to the Murdoch Center, named for a psychiatrist by the about By the 1960s,
despised people lay in, lay in an ordinary truism or a common label. No longer could I regard love the sinner and hate the sin as anything more than the banality of evil, sugar-coated to disguise a dreadful condemnation. Randall Deal's paintings are important works because they are vital art. Yet in the case of the Belcher Towns State School, the painting that you see, or reproduction of it, uh, can hardly be separated from the setting it depicts. Three figures appear in a room whose walls look as if, like the floor, they are made of concrete, only a shade lighter than the floor. Two lines run across the two walls, one line a separation between the blocks of concrete and the other the remains of what appears to be a thin strip of floral wallpaper. A cold water pipe extends from the ceiling to the floor with undifferentiated lettering running down the pipe. Also extending from the ceiling is the frayed cord of an unseen window shade that presumably covers from time to time the half visible window in the painting's upper left corner. Three figures appear in the gray interior. One stands with his eyes directed at the viewer, while the other two figures are seated on the floor with their hands bent downward toward their laps. The standing figure looks relaxed, though attentive, with each of his index fingers oddly beside his body pointing to the floor. Like the other two figures, I find it hot in here. Uh, like the other two figures, the standing man is dressed in a matched blue shirt and trousers suggesting routine institutional attire. The institutionalization is broken just a bit by his brown belt, his black shoes, and more than anything yet, else his red socks. Each of the two figures on the floor, with his face partially hidden from the viewer, shows no interest beyond the gaze fixed on his own lap. Unlike the standing figure, the two men on the floor are barefooted. But like the standing man, the man crouched on the floor, the men crouched on the floor, have on blue institutional clothes. One cute man has his hand on his head, and the other his hand has his and his cross legs and on the side. The gray and gray blue of the interior starkness is broken by a small sun outside the contrast of the interior color represented all of the two, nearly 200,000 intellectually stable women and men, girls and boys, among the 111 public residential institutions scattered among the states of the Union. There is some dispute about when this incarceration reached its epogee, but we can be certain that it was sometime between 1965 and 1975 depicted in the painting. Begun in hope and optimism by, among others, C. 
Samuel G. Howe in the late 1840s, these facilities had long since degenerated into concentration camps for the nation's most vulnerable, yet quite threatening, citizens. In all of these institutions were men and women, boys and girls, whose parents were told by their family physician to place their feeble-minded or mentally retarded child in the facilities and to forget about them for the health and well-being of the family. Or they were told, you are too poor or you are too mentally ill to care for your children, so put them away for their own good and your own good. For this very reason, thousands of people my age are today discovering that they have brothers and sisters that they never knew existed because a sibling had been put away, thus disappearing from the family. Besides the well-being of the family, physicians and social welfare authorities had justified massive incarceration of feeble minds because of their supposed threat to society's good health and safety. Using eugenics, at first explicitly and after World War II implicitly, these authorities convinced state lawmakers to construct more and more public holding facilities to halt the breeding by these so-called degenerates. Associated with prostitution, crime, welfare roles, and child abuse, these degenerates needed placement away from the harm they could render the general population, and at the same time needed watchful eyes to ensure that they did not parent more of their own kind. The institution, Belchertown State School, which Ronald Gill gives us a, a glimpse of, was never in 1922, the facility was the Commonwealth of Massachusetts response to both the overcrowded events and the nation's first public asylum, the eternal state school in Baltimore, and the perceived threat to both by the national community and the Well, until the 1960s, Belgian towns, like other
supplemental security income act represented one of the most remarkable changes in North American social policy. By the late, by the late 1980s, what I had experienced more than a decade earlier at Murdoch Center in North Carolina, and what Randall Deal represents in his painting of the Belchertown State School in Massachusetts, was, for the most part, no more. By no means have everything, has everything gone well over the past 30 years. But today, once institutional, institutional residents, now in their middle and old ages, have usually made successful adjustment into American communities. Some, like my friend Charles, have blended so well into ordinary community settings that they, they have lost the intellectual disability label. At the same time, the mainstreaming of intellectually disabled children in the nation's public schools has ensured that the institution will no longer be their inevitable fate. And the self-advocacy movement and court-mandated guardians ad litem have provided at least some guarantee that what never existed before, at least some guarantee of what never existed before, protection from neglect and abuse. But I end with words of caution, words that I wrote 20 years ago that I believe are still pertinent today. In a society that defines and confines all meaning and worth in terms of production, profit, pervasive greed, intellectually disabled people will likely be exploited. In this macro-sociological context, even the most vigilant advocates, whether in institutions or communities, cannot stop the exploitation. The, the debate if it is to be free of either or, must look beyond the locus of service to the content of production and to the place of disabled people in that content. Thus reframed, the issue of place becomes not just a matter of location, but also a matter of production. Thus one might imagine that in a world where definition and value of human beings are not based upon their productive capabilities, intellectually disabled people would be participating members of, for example, a boarding school or a kibbutz-like settlement, either of which would resemble an institution. At the same time, one can imagine in such a world, intellectually disabled people could live alone in apartments but have close friends, close circles of friends, all of whom live alone but share in each other's common time and experiences. Likewise, we know, we don't have to imagine, that both institutions and communities can be inhumane and exploitive. Each mirrors the world around it. A return to Christmas in purgatory institutions is in, no, in the interest of no disabled citizen. Nor is it in the interest of any citizen to return to the modern uh, equivalent of the county poorhouse, local jails, or indoor and outdoor relief. Thank you. Sir. Were there state boys in North, North Carolina? Yes. They, uh, they didn't cause quite as much tr trouble as they did at, at Fernal, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. there, there were, yes. And everywhere. They were, they were, they were everywhere. Um, uh, yes. Can you the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, uh, the question was, uh, were there state boys rebellions at Murdoch Center. State boys rebellions uh, is the title of a book and also an event that happened at the Fernal State School. Some boys um, were rebelled 
and caused quite a ruckus. And it's one of the rare times that people in one of those facilities ever challenged what was going on. Uh, the person who did the book, whose name I'm forgetting. Do you? D'Antonio. Yeah, D'Antonio. Uh, um, clearly demonstrated that the boys had been institutionalized, but they were never retarded. I mean, by again, any definition that, that one might have that are now. Jim, I have a question yeah. about language. Um, I remember visiting the New Hampshire State School um, and you know, seeing much the same thing that you described there. And I'm wondering about this school language, how widespread was it across the country? Why do people call these places schools? Um, well, they all had schools. Okay. <laughs> uh, Murdoch Center had a, a, a building at the institution that looked like a primary school. I mean, and some people went to it, uh, maybe 15, 20 percent of the residents. Um, so most of the facilities uh, had a school, but they had few educators, uh, they had few professionals, and with the Great Depression, World War II, it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, there was federal legislation at the end of World War II, the Mental Health Act, provided some temporary uh, funds for additional workers, but by the 60s, the, the, the same story it was um, very few professionals, very few uh, people who could, who could work, could, could, who had the time to do the necessary work for, for individuals that they needed to. I, you, some of you know that I've been very interested in the Perkins School, which is an institution. Um, it, it's the only institution I support today. <laughs> They have an endowment, maybe four times Gordon's, um, which allows them to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one educating. And that's what it takes. It takes money. And the public doesn't want to give money, especially not to people who are degenerate and, and threatening. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm serious. Why, why do you think it has taken you until so recently to write this story? Hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to answer. I think um, it's not because I've, I've, I've blocked it or, um, I mean, my wife certainly knows the story, to, and a few close friends. But uh, I, can, I think that's what I said early at, at the beginning. I, it, it didn't seem pertinent. It didn't seem that important. Um, but when I saw the painting, it just it, it seemed like a good time. I was also asked at Smith College, why did I take the job as a cottage parent? Which is very unusual for someone with the college degree to do that, and I, again, I couldn't answer. I don't think it was for heroic w reasons. It may have had to do with, you know, I was already out there, I knew it, it was safe to get the job. It, I wasn't doing it because I was, you know, trying to redeem these kids. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm not really sure in the history of institutionalization in Massachusetts. Others may know that a little better than I, but there's no question that people were sent to other facilities, especially if they had multiple disabilities. There was a blind rehabilitation center near Murdoch Center. If you were retarded and blind and they were feeling stressed, you might get sent to the rehab center. And definitely if you began to, to um, if you were high functioning, and then began to exhibit psychiatric issues. You'd be sent to the psychiatric facility at least for a while. So there was that shifting among among institutions. If if I'm answering your question. I was thinking of the reformatory. Yeah. Uh, they were being folks who had committed murders, folks who were. Um, 
Oh. Years of the reformatory, and there were people yeah. really um, had emotional, mental disabilities were put in because of um, not cooperating with their parents. Um, any name, any label that could be given to them. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, again, I, I I never worked in a reformatory, but I, I have no doubt that 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 was the case, and among certain certain folks, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. What was the role of racing chuck? No, I'm not chuckling. Um, North Carolina had four facilities, three for whites and one for blacks. Now that was before I was there. But segregation even worked in institutions for the feeble-minded. Yeah. So uh, Oberry Center was for black folks, and the other three were for, for white folks. Uh, again, by the time I was there, that it, it had changed. It, it was entirely integrated. But uh, race is really bizarre in terms of the eugenics movement. Almost all the examples in the literature are white people. Poor whites. Uh, someone's asked me recently why no African American folks that were pictured in the eugenics articles that came out. I, I think it was Ralph Ellison's invisibility. I mean, they were so they were so far gone. They didn't need to be herded in. It was the poor whites that needed to be herded in. Uh, it was one of the few times when race worked well. Relatively few African Americans were sterilized in these institutions. Now they were sterilized on the plantations, I mean, on, in plantations in the 20th century after slavery, but not in the institutions. Which again is kind of bizarre. What about class? Among the whites? Definitely were more poor people there. Although I remember very distinctly because I remember his Mercedes Benz. What was his name? Uh, it, it was uh, a very wealthy man and his wife had moved to the Carolinas from New York. You know, people do that. And um, they were very wealthy and they put their daughter in the division for adults. Her name was Vicki. I can't remember the last name. So there would be examples. And certainly well-to-do people were told by their physician to put their kids away. Um, I, he's long dead. The minister who married Sue and me put his daughter in Murdoch Center. Uh, I thought very highly of him, and I don't blame him for that because parents were told to do that. And it, it seemed if you don't do that, the family's going to fall apart. And maybe there was some truth in that because there were no services in the community. Yes, ma'am. Hey, everything you said, I worked at Vernal School right after I left Gordon. I actually did an internship from Gordon at Vernal School, so this is all very... You live to tell about it. Yeah, and in fact, in this painting, there were like 20 guys who were half us sitting on the floor. My first job was to teach a 20-step showering program to 10 naked guys sitting on the floor in the bathroom. I remember thinking, oh, as the first person to go to college in my family, if my parents could see me now. <laughs> but um, one thing, of talking about the deinstitutionalization, the people who fought that the most at Vernal were the parents yes. of, that had put their students, their children, in the institution because they had to sort of recant everything they had thought. I mean, they were told to put their child there, and now... Yeah. They're told this is wrong. It, it was really, really tough. It, it was, yeah, I experienced the same thing in North Carolina. And, and very good parents, but yeah. again, it, they had believed in something by an authority that they trusted, and suddenly the game was, had changed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Just a little louder. Uh, 
Where, where is the exploitation? Well, I think it's most, it's most evident in the eugenics movement. They were placed there to ensure that they didn't breed anymore. So people, uh, the public was, and again, the eugenic, I remember the eugenics board in North Carolina made up of very prominent citizens. Everybody in North Carolina knew it existed. It benefited ordinary citizens by, being, by ensuring that the riffraff didn't continue to breed. That seems exploitive to me. Do you not see it that way? And they moved from profound intellectual disability to psychosis, and it was um, yeah. Right, and even the best intentions, like there was a something called the Green Blind Unit because there had been an outbreak of rubella, and there was a whole population of students who were deaf and blind and profoundly intellectually handicapped, and they lived in this building that had heat on the floor. They would lie on mats all day long. They would be washed down on slabs and then put back on no stimulation, you know. Um, I can remember the hose, yeah. Yeah, scores of them. And, you know, there was very little we could do. We were, there were a lot of, I mean, the one saving grace for me is there were lots of college students from the Boston area working together there. So there was sort of a camaraderie among us that we were doing this great thing. but. Um, you know, and we became friends with these kids. I mean, we'd bring 14 of them to our little apartment sometimes, and you know, I mean, it was wonderful in some ways, and in, but most ways really horrible. I mean, it was like they're being punished. So, you know. Well, and that, I think the staff was exploited also. I mean, as I, th as I you know, have some distance from it, and I mean, even some of the officials at, at the school, I don't think they were intrinsically bad people. I think of Hannah Arendt's uh, banality of evil. I, that's what seems to be so important. We all can be in it, and when we're in it, it just doesn't seem like evil because we're part of it. Uh, the Roots are, were a, a system that was demanding that more and more people get institutionalized with less and less money. I mean, duh. So no. you would just, you know, like I at one point ended up being the only person with 20 guys who some were, who were really aggressive, you know. Oh yeah, I remember a little boy named Dempsey. He was cute, but he would, he would, he would come and hit you in the back and just knock you out and then he would laugh. He was supposed to be, he knew what he was, he knew what was going on. <laughs> um, I remember having my breath just knocked out of me as he hit, his head hit my back. Yeah. One thing that's always hit me fairly hard when I spoke to people when I was still working was that uh, during the heyday of eugenics, there was a Florida statute which stated the purpose of a new institution was being built. And it literally says so that these unfortunates may be prevented from reproducing their kind community relieved of the, get this, burden of their existence. Well, the, the notion of the burden of the feeble-minded, that was, and again, that, that wasn't hidden. It was talked about in professional meetings. The Eugenics Board in North Carolina had a very explicit statute. So it, it, it